let's move on a little bit and talk about kind of novel agents with antihormonal therapy. And that gets us to Bolero 2, which I think is something that has really been, at least over the last 18 months, you know, it's obviously presented at the European meetings almost 18 months ago, um, a big hit. And I actually was a skeptic. I was a, a Verolimus. I don't know if Edith's smiling. Some of us were skeptics. I was a, I was a real skeptic because I remember the first data. We all remember it was called RAD-01, and it really didn't look too great. And I think that I was, and we all did that trial, if we all remember, that trial was published in JCO. I think a lot of us here participated in that trial where we gave letrozole with CCI779, which was an intravenous, I believe it was an intravenous. Temserolimus. Temserolimus. Yeah. And so that didn't work. And so we were all like, oh, why is Blero 2 going to work? And so, so why don't you look, no, let her present no, it and no, we'll talk about it. Before, before, Hope, let yeah. me tell you that uh, you talk about not being a believer at the beginning. Uh, yeah. I actually, I, I was the chair of the IDMC for Bolero 2. Really? So I saw this study evolve from conception to really the conduct at the global level. And it was fascinating to uh, learn of the data, which uh, Hope will review for us. Yeah. I think <laughs> it, it is interesting because when the Temsorolimus study started, for whatever reason, we couldn't participate in it. And then, as you know, it was uh, reached a futility endpoint. Like five then, years ago. Uh, actually, I think seven years seven ago. Seven years ago. And, uh, and then Antonio Wolf, to his great credit, published it in the JCO because these studies really should be published. I mean, a thousand patients. Right. And um, it's really interesting because it's the kind of fulvestrant idea. It's not really clear that they had the right dose. You know, and there was, they kind of gave some, it's almost like uh, sunitinib, you know, where you give some and it's okay and you don't have too much toxicity, so you go forward with that. The other thing is that our paradigm has changed some. So the patients in that study who were treated in the early part of the last decade uh, really hadn't been exposed to AIs. And they hadn't been exposed to long duration adjuvant hormone therapy. And so these patients, you know, there was a subset who were very hormone sensitive and stay on treatment for a long time. So in that study, that's gonna be hard to see a difference. And they didn't see a lot of stomatitis, which we know is a marker of uh, mTOR inhibition at least as far as we can tell. Uh, so that study came out and actually Novartis at that point was ready to scrap their plans to do a phase three trial of Everolimus with the hormone therapy because it had been planned as a ME2 trial similar to the Temsorolimus trial. So uh, w some of us who were interested in Everolimus at that time said, let's do a neoadjuvant trial. We can then find a marker that predicts response. We were in our naive <laughs> days. And uh, we, well, we, <laughs> we only have one marker, naive. not right. eight, you know? <laughs> so right. the idea was, oh, we'll find a marker and a downstream marker for mTOR, it'll be great. So we did a global neoadjuvant trial that actually accrued very quickly. Jose Baselga published in the JCO and did the serial biopsies and learned a lot about the toxicity of Everolimus. I had not heard of interstitial pneumonitis until my patient started coughing. And uh, we showed that the clinical response was better, although you know we don't know what to do with the clinical response in, in uh, hormone receptor positive disease. Imaging by ultrasound was a little bit better, but the KI-67 dropped more in patients treated with Everolimus than those who received letrozole and placebo. Marker, absolutely nothing. We just, and you know, Looking back over it, we weren't as smart at looking at markers as we are now. So what markers did you use again in those trials? They were looking at S6, you know, as a yeah, really the, downstream the, marker. of uh, that's The ribosomal, S6 yeah. is a ribosomal protein that's kind of somehow related to mTOR expression, right? Yeah, well, yes. Theoretically. To, yeah, blocking mTOR expression. And so uh, it was interesting. I mean, we looked at all those markers in all different ways, couldn't make anything work. So then the idea was, okay, so the markers didn't work, what should we do? And uh, the thought was, well, if the PI3 kinase pathway is... Um, in, at least in preclinical models, seems to be mutated more as cancers progress through the metastatic phase. The idea would be let's treat patients who clearly have progressed on a non-steroidal AI, and maybe that will be the right population. So it's actually kind of intriguing that that worked, you know, that sort of clinical idea in such a heterogeneous population of patients. So the trial was randomized two to one to receive uh, exomestane and everolimus versus extomestane and placebo, and these patients could have received up to two prior lines of hormone therapy, and a small percentage of patients received chemotherapy, one line in the metastatic setting, but most had not received chemotherapy. And also, interestingly, quite a large number of patients had visceral disease, which is a sort of miss, people think, oh, if you have visceral disease, you need chemotherapy, but uh, clearly that wasn't the case. And uh, having been less of a skeptic, I still was very surprised at the results. I mean, the big difference in progression-free survival that was seen by independent review, the primary endpoint, and then even a bigger difference by independent review, which were not, investigator review was 
significant and then independent review is even bigger. Not what we're used you, to so you're on the, Do they even consider composing the trial? You're on the DSMB. Are you allowed to talk about that uh, online? Uh, no, the, the trial, you know, well, when the trial was uh, d designed and planned, you know, it was all, all the way right. uh, go because... They're very uh, big yeah, stopping rule. Yes. Rails is a very it big stopping rule. For, for toxicity right, yeah. and for futility rather than that for benefit. Right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, well, one aspect that uh, I thought was really interesting between the new adjuvant and then the, the metastatic study is that if people had only follow the new adjuvant study for pathological complete response to make a decision of whether to invest in the metastatic setting, we would have missed Bolero too, because the new adjuvant study did not show an improvement in pathological complete response by adding Everolimus. But because of the quirk with K67, that was viewed as something positive. But now we know that K67 is totally an unreliable marker. <laughs> so it was so. <laughs> so this is, I mean, this is now, now we're questioning the whole movement so to go to neoadjuvant <laughs> therapy. We're well, questioning no. all everything tonight. In you know, hormone so that's receptor positive disease, it's, yeah. a very, it's very difficult to know what to use as your endpoint when you're looking for hormone like therapies. And I think that's a challenge for all of the trials that are going on now, even the ones looking at palbociclib, for example. You just don't know what the right endpoint should be. But in addition, you know, Bolero also looked very carefully at toxicity, and we've presented in uh, poster form, hopefully to be published soon, looking at the time frame, because people have been worried about stomatitis as a toxicity from uh, Everolimus. And, you know, these patients are on oral hormone therapy. They have metastatic disease. We're not curing them. Uh, and all, the survival difference looks very good, but we still, the last time we reported survival difference, we still needed uh, twice as many results in order to reach the end point. So uh, that won't be till next year, probably, end of this year at the earliest. And so you're probably still seeing that. But the, um, the so you don't want to give people a lot of stomatitis, you know, grade three stomatitis in 8%. Interstitial pneumonitis was uncommon, and you can generally manage that. Somebody coughs, you get a chest x-ray, hold the drug, you know, reduce the dose. But stomatitis was harder, and then people would get anorexia and weight loss and fatigue, all is kind of interrelated. Uh, but it, subsequently we found, and, and I credit much of this to a, a conversation I had with Joyce, but uh, is that we uh, started using steroid uh, mouthwash as a preventive for with a little antibiotic thrown in, not clear if you need it, but uh, if you use the steroid mouthwash as a preventive, people don't get mouth sores. So that was a big improvement for us. Uh, and the mouth sores generally occur only in the first uh, two weeks. Really, two months, was, two months hope, right? Well, for, that's a question, I mean. Eight weeks, right, on your yeah, day of the first to yeah. their credit with this drug, you know, really has pushed management of side effects. And it was a big thing for them. I think that unlike other companies, you know, they really pushed that the, the said, look, this is going to be a different, you know, set of side effects for the oncologist who usually manages hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. And they really push it. The steroid mouthwash, I really have never tried. I do have about 10%. I don't know. I'm curious to hear what other people say mm -hmm. in their practice. I have about 10% of people who I really have to stop it. They just won't do it anymore. That will go away, Adam, when you start using um, mouth rinses. It's, it's, really? a, it's a night and day and really have to emphasize it. this. It's a, it'll go away. Okay. We don't